Hello, my name is Wesley Dunn. I'm the Minister of Discipleship at First Baptist Owensboro. And today I want to walk through a study of Romans that our Sunday school classes are, are going through. Uh, during this time, obviously, our Sunday school classes are not able to meet at First Baptist Owensboro. And, and so we want to, to continue to get the teaching through the book of Romans. We, we see it as valuable and hope that you're able to use this uh, to continue your own personal study through the, the book of Romans. For those that are not a part of our church, there are many of us who um, meet every week here at First Baptist in Sunday school classes. And we study the Bible week after week. We walk through books of the Bible together. We follow uh, LifeWay's Explore the Bible curriculum. Uh, their personal study guides that they use on a day-to-day -day basis look like this. And as we walk through these books of the Bible, we are able to see uh, what God has to say to us uh, not only for greater knowledge of who He is, but also to put into obedience and action what we're hearing from the Word of God. So if you're one of our people, if you're one of the people from First Baptist, uh, hopefully this is uh, just beneficial for you during this time as we're not able to meet. Obviously, it does not replicate the, the opportunity we have on a regular basis to be together. There's nothing like being together as brother, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, in the room together studying, uh, but this is one way to continue our study. If you have joined us, uh, we hope that you'll continue to join us. This is, uh, during this time of being away, this is something I hope to continue to do and provide for our people, but we ask that you continue to walk through the study with us. As I mentioned, we will be in Romans, and so uh, if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to turn to Romans. We'll be in chapter 2 of, of this book. Uh, our, our classes, and you as those in the classes, have already gone through two sessions so far in Romans, but uh, this last session you were unable to be here, and so I wanted to, to have this video available for you to watch and to keep up. So uh, before we jump into our study uh, time together, I want to uh, ask the Lord to bless our time of study in His Word. Let's pray. Father, as we dive into Your Word here in Romans chapter 2, we are grateful for your revelation to us that you would see fit to, to communicate the truths that we need in our lives. And Lord, our, our prayer is that your spirit would work through your word, that your spirit would, would convict us, would challenge us, would encourage us in, in a number of ways. And Father, wherever we are as we are listening to this, Lord, our prayer is that your spirit would bring about a greater obedience in our lives that we may follow you and help others to follow you in a greater fashion as well. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as you have been in Romans so far, really the overarching theme of Romans could probably be summed up, and, and Mark Dever says this, it'd be summed up in one word, justification. And ultimately the question that Paul spends much of his time, the, the author of Romans is the Apostle Paul, much of his time is spent in answering that justification question. How can a person be made right with God? How can a person be right with the creator of the entire universe? And that's what Paul himself is, is asking and, and eventually is answering in his, his writing to uh, these, these folks, these believers in Rome. The first lesson, as you were able to go through it in, in chapter 1, really hinged on that verse that says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is our only hope. And when I say gospel, it's the good news of Jesus Christ that's our only hope. And not only was that first lesson hinging on that, but, but it ultimately suggested and encouraged believers that, that believers should be compelled to share the good news the good news of Jesus, the gospel message with others. And so that was lesson one. That was, that was the beginning of chapter one. Uh, lesson two continued on in chapter one. And we saw in that, that lesson that God has made himself known. He's made himself evident to all people, both through general revelation, which we see in creation all around us, but also in special revelation as He's given us His Word, He's given us the Bible so that we can know Him. But 
even though there is this special revelation, he, he spoke much on that general revelation that man is without excuse because of how God has revealed himself through the power of all that we see around us in his creation. And man ultimately has a choice. Our choice is to worship the one who has created all of this, worship the creator, or worship the created thing. We worship so many idols, but but there is only one to be worshipped, and that's the decision that Paul puts before, before us that every human has to deal with. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl has to come to grips with whether or not we're going to worship God the Creator or idols created things. And as someone deals with that, if they choose to worship the created thing, to worship idols and ultimately reject or ignore God Himself, as the one who is ruler of their entire life and entire universe, that leads to absolute destruction. And man is found guilty before a holy and just and, and righteous God. That leads us to the third session, or the, the third lesson in our Explore the Bible curriculum as we walk through Romans, and it is, is an, entitled Insufficient. We will be in Romans chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 17. But as we start our time, I do have a question that I, I want to pose to you. And as we go through this, I, I know it, it's obvious you won't be able to interact with me. And I like to teach in a very interactive uh, fashion and, and dialogue. But I will pose some questions. And as I do, I want to encourage you to, to take time to think through these questions and, and to not just listen to me ask them, but to, to actually engage them and maybe even put pen to paper and, and write some of these things down. But uh, as we begin, um, I wanted to share with you, I, at our house, we eat a lot of avocados. I, I eat an avocado for breakfast every morning. Um, Julie, my wife, loves making guacamole. And as we do that, uh, as we uh, eat these, um, we, I'll grab one and occasionally... I'll grab one that looks great on the outside. I, I wash it up, um, get the knife, and then I, I go to, to slice into it. And when I do so, even though it looks great on the outside, even though everything on the external feels good, looks good, I'll cut it open, and from time to time I'll open that thing up, and it will be no good on the inside. It'll be ruined on the inside. There'll be nothing uh, of value on that inside. It is it's rotten. And when that happens, I'm obviously bummed quite a bit um, uh, to not have that, that ripe and ready avocado to eat. But as I think about the lesson today and I think about what Paul is communicating today, there's a whole lot of truth to the illustration of that avocado. Things can look really good on the outside. The external can, be, can, can look great, but the inside could be completely brown, completely dark, completely ruined and, and ultimately, as, um, as Paul is going to tell us in this passage, completely guilty, completely insufficient to carry out what it, we're supposed to do. And so, as you think through your own life, as I think through my own, like the avocado, in what ways am I worried about, concerned about what I look like on the outside but the inside doesn't match that. And that's what Paul's going to deal with as we walk through Romans chapter 2. So we think about the context. You've already built a little bit of a context as you've walked through the first two sessions of Romans. But Paul is writing here to both Jews and Gentiles in Rome. Paul's not been able to be with these folks. He's not been there with them, but he's writing to them with a deep love. He's communicated in other locations, as, as can be found even in Acts, that he longs to, to visit them. He wants to, to come, that his plans are to travel and be with these believers in Rome, um, but he has yet to be able to be with them, so he's writing this to them. And we see uh, an unbelievable treatment throughout Romans of a lot of basic beliefs of the Christian faith. And Paul is going to deal uh, quite often in these early chapters with the relationship between Jews and Gentiles and, and, and faith and belief, belief um, and what truly makes one right or justified before God. 
And so as we uh, arrive at Romans chapter 2, verse 17, know this, he's already been talking, as you've seen, uh, about God's uh, judgment and uh, where man stands in guilt. But here's what he says, and I want to start in verse 17 and read for you. He says this, Now if you call yourself a Jew, now obviously he's writing uh, to, the, to those who are Jew, Jewish um, in Rome. He says, Now if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know His will and approve the things that are superior, being instructed from the law, and if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law, you then, who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal. Do you steal? You who say, you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob their temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. In 17 through 24, as we've already seen revealed, the Apostle Paul is speaking to those who have a Jewish background. What he's communicating to them in this is that he's revealing their hypocrisy. He's revealing that what they know and what they do are two different things. And so as we look at this, we can see uh, at the very beginning if you're relying on the law and you're boasting in God and you know His will, all these things, they knew, the Jews, they knew God's law, His Ten Commandments, what He had written in the Old Testament, they were very familiar with. And they were boasting in that. They were proud of that. The Apostle Paul himself even referred to him uh, in, in other locations uh, in, the, in the Scriptures that he was a Jew of all Jews. Paul knew what it was like to know the law well and to boast in the knowledge of the law. But what he wanted to bring to their attention was this. You may know it, but are you actually living it out? And he goes on to, to share with them that their hypocrisy, the difference between what they knew about God and His ways and their actions, it, it didn't line up. Their hypocrisy actually prevented them from fulfilling God's intentions for their, their life and, and ultimately as a nation, as a people. So their walk did not back up their talk. And as we think about that for our own lives, this is, can be quite convicting. We can look at this and yes, we can, we can look at the Jews and, and be very condemning on, on their life and their situation and man, they... They were God's people. They, they had the blessings of God all over them. They were chosen by Him, and they were given the law, yet they still couldn't live by faith like they should have. Why not? Yet in our own lives, many of us have the blessing of a, a history of being in the church, a history of, of hearing sermon after sermon, of hearing Bible study after Bible study, just like this one, Yet there are times in our lives where what we know doesn't equate to obedience and faith and action. The question we must ask ourselves as we come to this place is, how consistent am I in keeping God's Word? I need to evaluate that in my own life. You need to evaluate that in your life. Am I consistent in keeping God's Word? Paul uses this section to reveal the hypocrisy that's going on in the life of those Jews. Now, when we come to verse 25, we see him begin to talk about something that was, um, was common for the Jewish nation at that time. And he begins to talk about circumcision. And before I read 25 through 27, I, I do want to talk about that. Circumcision was a sign, uh, an outward sign of the covenant and commitment that the Jewish people had with the Lord. And so he, he gets right to that here in verse 25. And so I want to 
I want to read this for you and begin to talk about what Paul is communicating. It says this in verse 25, Circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised, but who keeps the law, will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. So we see here that Paul has, in the first section, talked about how their life product does not match up with what they know and what they're boasting in. And now something else that they would boast in, their physical marker of their relationship with God, being His chosen people, he gets right to the, to the base of it and says, listen, you could potentially also boast in your, uh, your Jewishness in circumcision, but what I'm here to tell you is that the core of the gospel, it's, it's this, that you may have that on the outside, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter because you can have the symbol or the sign of a relationship with God on the external, but really, if you're breaking the law, it's actually better that you, you don't have the sign and you keep the law. Ultimately, what he's communicating is that Obedience is required before the Lord. Obedience is required before the Lord. And so we see here that, um, that God Himself requires, through His Word, that obedience is, is what reconciles a person before God. Now, even as I say that, I hope you, you sit here and go, but, but is, is that true? Is that right? that obedience to the law and fulfillment of the law in our lives is what is going to reconcile us, justify us, make us right before the Lord? Yes, that is what God's Word says. If I go back and look at uh, chapter 2, verse 13, For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Obedience to the law is what brings justification. Fulfillment of the law brings a righteousness on our account before God. But as you and I both know, we can't keep the law. He's already told the Jews, as he's writing to them, listen, you know the law, but you've never kept it. You can't keep it. Your ancestors couldn't keep it. You can't keep it. But as we sit and think about this, we can't keep it either. So it leaves us in quite the predicament. If as verse 13 says, doers of the law will be justified. Where does that leave us if we can't keep it? This shows us that we are insufficient. We are insufficient before God to make our account right to be justified. We need a Savior who can bring justification for us. And he moves on in this passage in the last few verses that we'll, we'll look at today. In, um, in our time together. He says this in verse 28, for a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. And once again, he's getting to the external. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. And true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew, or I should say and could say that a person is in the family of God who is one inwardly. And circumcision is of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter, not just carrying out the law and, and, and knowing it and boasting in it, but, but by the Spirit of God. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. What he's saying here is that, once again, the external, the circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. One is not a member of the family of God because of what they do in their own efforts, in their own attempts to be right before God. What he's saying is here that you need a heart transformation. Your heart needs to be cut by the Lord. Your heart needs to be molded and shaped and changed by the Spirit of God. That's why he says here that circumcision is the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter. 
I see this in my own life. I see, um, as I look at my own salvation, my own efforts to to win the favor of God or to be reconciled with God, to be justified and made right before Him, are bankrupt, insufficient. I grew up in a um, in a church background, and everything on the external in my own life would have looked great. But if anybody could have cut me in half and looked at my heart like we could cut that avocado in half and look at it, you could see that on the inside, the heart was not right. You might think in your own life about your own salvation and, and think, you know, that was me. I, I, I needed a heart transformation. The only way that we will be made right or justified before God is if we have a new heart. And we can't do anything um, to earn that. We can't do any, uh, carry out any efforts or um, actions to, to garner the favor and the righteousness of God, we need Him to give us a new heart. Now, as you think about this, you may be, you may be thinking in your own life right now, and I, this is something I want you to ask yourself as we study this. What ways even currently, now that I am a believer, what ways am I currently concerned about the external more than I am what's going on in my heart? Am I worried about what I look like when I come to be around other people at the, the church building? Uh, when we gather, and I look forward to us gathering again, as I know you do, am I worried just about what I look like on the outside or, or, or how my reputation is perceived amongst other people just on the outside? Or am I more concerned about what God is doing in my heart? In addition to that, one of the questions I would ask you is, um, do you do you carry that out on your own heart in your own life and do you do that with others you're around or do you bring about a judgment on how they look like on the outside and you're concerned more about their external and their behavior on the outside more than what's going on on their inside you see someone can look very shiny and good on the outside for their entire life but have at the core as we talked about here, never had their heart circumcised, never had their heart changed or transformed. And that leads, as we saw in session two, to destruction, eternal destruction, hell, with no hope. But what we need to be more concerned with in other people's lives, and this is what I would ask you, are you concerned with what's going on in their heart? This is applicable for, for people of any age. Um, and I'm, I'm in the, the stage of life, this is very applicable for me as a parent. Am I as concerned about what's going on with the shell of my children and their behavior on the outside so that I look good as a parent and, and have a great reputation as a parent? Or am I more concerned about what's going on in the heart of my children? It's a tough question I have to ask myself, and I would encourage you to ask your own yourself, where in my own life am I Carrying this out or not carrying this out, and what changes do I need to make? This is a very important lesson for us as a church, and um, it can it can really have an impact on how we carry out ministry amongst each other, and as well as as with others. Uh, are we going to be more concerned with the external? Or are we going to more be more concerned with what's going on in the heart of people? And if you're joining us today, and and you're one who has taken Paul's words here in Roman 2 to heart and, and you're evaluating your own life thinking, you know, I'm more worried about being a good person than I am about really having a heart transformation. I, the Spirit of God has never changed my heart and I, I want to know how. Well, um, that can happen through faith and repentance. To repent of what sin and guilt you have in your life and turn in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, I know that I am insufficient to be made justified, be made right before God. And, and I, want, I want that. So Lord, please give me a new heart. That's the, that's the prayer you can have today. If you have questions about that, we, anyone here at First Baptist would, would love to chat with you about that. You could um, go to our website, fbcowb.org. You can look up our contact information there. 
um, and, and give us a call, send us an email. We'd love to chat with you more about what it looks like to have a right relationship with the creator of the entire universe. I'm thankful to be able to have this time together with you today in sharing from Romans chapter 2. Look forward to doing more of these with you in this unique time that we are apart from one another. And, um, and we'll have more of these videos coming soon. But in the meantime, as you are um, away from others and, and away from the body of Christ in, in our current state, there are still ways that you can be taking care of one another. You can be concerned with making, maturing, and multiplying disciples for the glory of God. And I want to pray for us now that that would be our heart even during this time. Let's pray. Father, you have given your word to us today to challenge us, as we've already prayed that you would, to challenge us, to change us, to mold us, to shape us into the, the form of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we're challenged today to be concerned more with what's going on on the inside, our hearts, than we are with the external. Or we know that a heart change will produce fruit on the outside. There will be a, an, an evidence of what's going on on the inside. But Lord, give us a burning desire to have our hearts change day by day, moment by moment by you. Lord, help us to dive into your word and for your spirit to work through the word to bring about change in our lives. Lord, for those that might be watching that have never had a heart transformation, they've never turned to your son Jesus as Lord and Savior, our prayer today is that they would have an understanding of who you are, who they are, and their need for your son Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray all this in the name of your son Jesus Christ. Amen.